Hello and welcome to Conversations from the NF Podcast. In this episode, we speak to Gaina, an adult adoptee. Gaina has recently wrote her story in a book as a form of letters that reflect her experience and the complexity and challenge of adoption across her family. She shares some of that in the podcast, and you can, of course, find out more if you seek out her book. As always, if you've experienced adoption, fostering, or special guardianship from any perspective, personal or professional, and would like to share that on the podcast, please do get in touch through Facebook or Twitter, or you can email us at andfpodcast at gmail.com. Hi, I'm Gaynor. Um, I'm known as Gaynor sherry Ann. I use that name because I've written a book, so that's my author name. It's actually my first name and my middle name, Gaynor sherry Ann. Um, I've written my memoir recently. Um, which is called An Adoptee's Journey, Letters of My Life. I've written it in the form of letters because I'm not a natural writer um, Mm. and it wasn't a massive passion I had all my life to be a writer or anything like that. I just had a sudden moment where I wanted to tell my story, mainly for my grandchildren because when I've told my story over the years to friends and colleagues and so on, they've always said, oh, that's a really interesting story. You should write it down. Um, And you think, don't be stupid. Um, But eventually you get to an age where you think, "Mm, I think I would like my family to know. So you start to sort of make some notes. And um, and then that'll pop something on Facebook about writing your own book. And I thought, well, I might as well just look into this and see what's going on. So I joined a group and the rest is history. I've now got a, I'm now a published author. I've written my book. Excellent. Um, there, well won't, done. there won't be any more books coming from me. I've got <laughs> nothing else to say. But um, it was extremely cathartic. I really loved every minute of it. Um, and it really helped me as a person. I've, I feel like I've moved on and put a lot of stuff behind me, having written it in a book. I mean, I've uh, you were really kind to send me a copy with a tea bag and a pen and a, a postcard, which is very nice, and a little note. And so, um, I mean, the the book itself is uh, really interesting because it it I, I sort of came to it totally cold, and you know, I just I kind of haven't general knowledge of you know the experience of adult adoptees and um but i found it from the from the very beginning really quite engaging in a peculiar way so um do you want to I, do you feel comfortable to sort of tell me a story really that's yes. you know. yeah yeah so um as at, a, at the moment i'm um, a mother myself i've had four children they're all grown up and i'm a granny of four at the moment too i suspect that will get bigger over the years I'm sure I'll get more grandchildren um I'm in a really good place in my life um which is probably why I found it a good time to write my story for my family um so basically I am one of the adopted children stroke babies that was in the 60s where adoption was generally forced Not everybody was forced to give up their babies, of course, but there was a big, big majority of mothers that were forced to, mainly because they weren't married, they were unmarried and usually quite young. Oh, there's all different circumstances for everyone, but that, if you want to generalise and put them in a box, then there were a lot of unmarried young mothers who were just not allowed through society, the church, um, and the health service, really, like yeah. social workers and so forth, they were f- pushed to give their babies away. Most of them would have made brilliant mothers and did carry on to make brilliant mothers later on, um, but they were told to forget that child, that child had gone. They were never, ever allowed, told they would never, ever meet that child again, um, and it had gone from their lives, and they'd got to forget. Mm. Bottom, bottom line, you've got to forget it ever happened to you. So my mum was 16, my birth mum was 16, and that is exactly what happened to her. She had to go into a mother and baby home, there were lots of them about, where you um, lived with all the other girls of a similar, you know, situation. Um, You had to work somewhere horrendous, if you've ever heard of the Magdalene um, laundries, some were like workhouses. Others were just okay, you know, you were looked after, you had to work and do, to pay your board and stuff but you also had to pay to be there your parents had to usually 
pay towards your upkeep. Um, but while you were there, you were, you know, um, kept very busy. Um, and you gave birth often at the home. Sometimes you were taken to hospital, but they usually had their own midwife. Um, lots of people have horrendous stories about the types of birth that went on and how they were treated badly. My mum's wasn't the worst by any means. The home wasn't the worst. She sometimes remembers it quite fondly as like a girls club, like as if she'd gone to boarding school, you know, with a load of pregnant girls kind of thing. So hers yeah. was not a bad one. There were some horrendous ones out there. Hers wasn't one of them. She she would tell you that herself. Um, and so then you look after your own baby for six weeks. Some homes encouraged you even to breastfeed. But mostly they put the babies on bottle straight away. Um, and the mothers were, they literally looked after their own baby. So they built a bond with those babies. There were some places where the babies were taken from them and the mother never even got to see the babies. So, you know, everybody's story is different. But my yeah. mum's, she kept me for six weeks and looked after me for six weeks. Um, my dad came to see me. My grandparents came to see me all in that home. Um, so. You know, but then the social workers came along and said, right, it's time. This baby's going, sign this piece of paper. And off I went um, to a new home. And she was told all the usual things. You've got to forget it. You've got never, never talk about it. it the pain will go away, you know, um, and her parents never tried to speak of it again. They told her never to tell um, anybody else, you know. Uh, they also said to her, you know, you'll never get another boyfriend um, because no man will ever want you, you know, your damaged goods, all that kind of thing went yeah. on. Um, so she had to go back and get on with her life at 16 years old. And I was brought up by different family, given a new name. Um, and, you know, the, the, the family I was brought up with did tell me I was adopted. It was recommended the recommendations of the social workers at the time were not everybody did, but um, it was recommended that you told them, you told them they were chosen and they were special and you'd pick them. And those kind of little fairy stories that went along with it. Um, that's what, and they did do that. My adoptive yeah. parents did do that. So I always knew, but then from then on, it was a taboo subject. They never wanted other people to know. They wanted people to think they were we were their children. When I say we, I mean my sister, who was adopted two years after me. No relation to me, totally different mother and everything, um, different circumstances, etc. So, but if I say we, that's what I mean. So yeah. we never um, talked about it. It was never encouraged. You never allowed to ask any questions. Um, my sister once told a group of friends and it got back to the parents and she was severely told off and sent to bed with no tea and all the usual, you know, um, smacks and stuff. Um, so, so I did grow up with a sister. Um, we weren't particularly close. We hadn't, I mean, there were no genes connecting us for a start off. Mm. Um, uh, so can I but, ask then, because I, I think so that would be the seventies as you grew, so yeah, that grew into childhood, um, which is because I'm just a little bit younger than you. So I I grew up in the seventies, and I remember that um, adoption was a thing. You know, people, you know, it was a, it was quite well known about everyone. You know, that um, and when you look at the numbers, that was probably the prime area of children growing up adopted. Um, yeah, it was. So it was quite well known, and I, how did you make sense of that in your head? I mean, in some ways, it. I guess it's all you've ever known. But was there sort of moments where that you start to question that? Not when you're little. Um, yeah. It doesn't. You, being told you were chosen, being told you were adopted, didn't mean anything particularly to you. Um, it's, basically, it's the usual as you get to teenage years. We all, every teenager has, you know, teenage issues, um, and it was just another another thing you know in the mix um where you then start thinking why did my real mother give me up wasn't mm. I wanted what was wrong with me wasn't I good enough you know teenage stuff until then it was fine until then it was just you didn't know any different you also because we were brought up in a church environment um there were quite a lot of other adopted 
adopted children within that church environment. So you met others in the same situation. Because back then, um, if you went to church and you got your vicar's approval, you stood a much better chance of being allowed to adopt children. You were a much better person then because you yeah. went to church. Um, so there were a lot of them. So there was quite a time, you know, I grew up with a few other friends who were adopted as well. So it wasn't that weird, really. Um, but when you get to teenagers and you're at senior school and people start talking about stuff, that's when you start to think, you know, um, I'm not the same as them and wonder where my real mum is and stuff. Um, and then the adoptive parents, it wasn't the best adoption. I didn't get physically abused, so it wasn't the worst adoption. Um, but they were very um, vindictive type of people. She was a narcissist. Um, so I didn't have the best of adoptions. So when you're in your teenagers and the other friends are all moaning about their mothers, you're doing it as well. Yeah. But at least I used to think I didn't share any genes with her. I wasn't going to turn out like her. <laughs> well, that's... Um, I mean, that's not yeah. insignificant, is it? That um, It's not. Because, yeah, a teenager in a different circumstances would look at their parents and go, oh, crikey, this is the cloth I'm cut from. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and, my and, poor kids do. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you moved then into young adulthood, and it sounds like you, I mean, reading the book, it's clear that you've you've skimmed across a lot of stuff in terms of your relationship with your your adoptive parents and it sounds like yeah. quite a toxic yeah environment but again when i was really you know a small child it was fine um because they were very good with small children um you know they treated them like pets they were very good with pets they had lots of dogs they loved them so, they were great because you can control them yeah the minute you started to have your own opinion and yeah and it the wheels came off sort of thing yeah so Definitely. you move into into young adulthood, and um, was adoption still part of like your who you were? Was that part of your identity? You know that did you see yourself in those terms, or were you just sort of getting on with your life? No, I think I was just sort of getting on with it. I don't think it really hit me big time until I had my own children. Um, right, you just get on with life, and it's in the background. Um, and there's lots of stresses in your life anyway, aren't there? And lots of things going on in your life, and you're a young person, and you're meeting a chap and you having a relationship and you're having a new job and all those things in life um so you just get on with it really um yeah it, it it doesn't really well for me it didn't really really come to a head until I had my own children so then you have that massive how can someone give away this baby you're holding this baby that you've just given birth to in your arms and you you want to know more you want to know why did they give me away? Um, and some today's adoptions have usually usually got genuine reasons why those babies were taken. We won't get into all that, but I've got friends and I know lots of people over the years. Um, and it's a totally different situation these days as to why the children come into the system to be adopted um, than it was back then. And uh, I suppose I always then I started to think like I hope I was a baby from you know love I hope I came from love as opposed yeah. to the other which many children did yeah um, and I, I'm delighted to say I was when I found my parents they had married each other they were in love with each other and they had married each other and I did come from love and I was it was just amazing to find that out um, and I found out that I got two two full sisters as well because they went on to have two more girls and I've had a wonderful um, reunion and I know I'm very lucky and pe other people have awful times yeah. you know and um, the sister I grew up with even the actual growing up bit she would tell you a different story from me don't get me wrong she would still say it wasn't the best adoption yeah. and, the, and the mother was a narcissist um, that side of it we've got you know, that thing in common that we will always have the same, that part of it. But even she saw different things differently from me. Um, when she read my book, she didn't agree with absolutely everything, but she, everyone's in talk to their own opinion and you see things yeah. like in life differently, don't you? Um, yeah. yeah. But Can she then found her birth family and she had a totally different um, 
outcome yeah. from me. And unfortunately, that's made it slightly tricky. I think she's a little bit jealous of my wonderful relationship. Um, mm. But you, it is what it is, isn't it? I can't help who my birth parents were and what happened to them, and she can't help hers. Um, yeah. At least, at least she did find them, and she knows who they are. So I will think that that's a bonus. So can I ask you back to you sort of holding your own child, um, uh, your son in yeah. your arms and um, yeah. this sort of all of a sudden this sort of this door opening to this whole sort of yeah. experience and emotions. And what, what do you do then? Because in the, in the midst of all of that, you've got a newborn baby, you're a young, yeah. you're, you're a new mum. And that's where, what were the first steps then? And obviously you, you, you had so a you, husband. You, you do you do quash it. You do quash it to start right. off with. Um, and um, it only comes to you on occasions. It over sort of washes over you from time to time. Um, but it set the seed for you thinking, one day I have to find these people. I need to know where I've come from. Um, so having my first child did that. Um, and then the relationship wasn't great and the marriage broke up anyway. So I had all that to deal with. Yeah. Um, but then I met my now husband. We've been married over 35 years. Um, and he is my best friend and, you know, the person that supported me all my life. And so he was there for me when I did go down the route of f- finding my birth family. He was by my side. He helped me um, and he would have helped me, whatever the outcome was. And you do talk it through that you've got to think of the worst outcome. It could be the worst outcome. They may have died. They may not want to know you, um, but yeah. you still want to know. Yeah. So what was the process then? I mean, did you just, pick, where do you start? Back then it was a lot harder than it is these days. These days people find it so much easier. You can Google this, you can Google that, you can Facebook, you can search people. So, so I mean, everybody's out there, aren't they? <laughs> these days they've got yeah. They've got digital footprint. You can find them. Back then, you had to you had to apply to your local council, your records, and then you had to have an appointment with a counsellor um, at council offices, and the counsellor had to sit with you and open your file with you, and go through your file with you. Um, and at some that point, some people get told this file is closed. We can't we can't share it with you. It's horrendous. We can't. It's I wasn't. I was lucky. I didn't have any of those things. Um, lovely lady who talked it through. And I think the main thing that struck me at that point was that I'd had a different name, that I was a different person. I'd been, mm. it was like, who is this other person? This, you know, um, yeah, I didn't know my original name. So it was just, it was, I think I found that as the biggest surprise and the biggest shock, really. And I had to come to terms with that a little bit before I then started to search. Um, but it wasn't that hard then. You went to the records office and you'd got some information and you just got the old telephone book out and, you know, <laughs> tried looking for names and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so it wasn't hard. I didn't, it wasn't long before I managed to track them down and trace them and find them and ring them up and... Uh, but the first time my husband spoke to um, my mother the first time, not me, because I was too scared. I was shaking so much. Um, so he always claims it's he spoke to his mother, mother-in-law first before I did. Um, yeah. And then it took many years to become a proper family um, because this, they are thinking of you. First of all, they're thinking of you as that other name. They were always think of me, thinking of me as Sherry. For 30 odd years, they thought of me as that. And all of a sudden, I've come along with a different name and they've got to get used to that. And, you know, they handed over a baby. And here I am, an adult, a mother with children of my own. So they've suddenly gained grandchildren as well. So it's a big, big adjustment for everybody. Yeah. Um, it, it does sound like it. And you've skipped across, um, skip, you've covered an awful lot of ground really quickly there and just even i could tell <laughs> well, when these you, people want details they'll have to buy my book <laughs> i see how that works i do see how that works um <laughs> um i just thought um what was really interesting even it, it, it was a sense of even when you were describing that you you opened your file and there was this this child with another name almost like a disconnect like yeah you're trying to reconcile you yourself and this person yeah, and trying to and join them. Person. Yes, the name took time to process. 
Um, but I am an impatient person. So I did search very quickly and, and got a move on. And once my once I'd worked out who they were, um, I contacted them, all doing it all the wrong way round. You shouldn't do anything like that. You should go through an intermediary if you're going to do it properly, but I didn't. Um, so, yeah, I did kind of rush it a bit. And then they came to see me because they did only leave my parents, birth parents, as I said, were married. So they only lived an hour away. So that wasn't horrendous. So they did come and meet me. But then, of course, I had a very busy life at that time. I'd got young children. So it wasn't like you saw each other every week. They weren't just around the corner. Um, I kept, I probably did keep in touch by phone call every week. We didn't see each other all the time or because that's not real life, is it? Um, it took a long time to get to know them, to build up a relationship. Um, and even to, to well, I, I was okay calling them mum and dad, but my adoptive parents were yeah. in my life still at that time. So I didn't let my children actually know who they were at first because I didn't tell the adoptive parents because of the type of people they were. Um, so they had to be called auntie and uncle. Um, and I just told them they were friends of mummies from a long, long time ago. So that's how my children first met them and knew them because I couldn't be open about it with the adoptive parents still in my life. And that's awful, really, isn't it? Amidst all of the complications anyway, that that additional layer of having to kind of, you know, protect your children from the ire of your adoptive parents or the yes. disapproval or whatever that looked like. Um, yes. That must have been a, must have been really grating and frustrating yeah. for you. Yeah, it was. It, it was it was quite tricky. And I've always said adoption is secrets and lies. The type of adoption I had back in the 50s, 60s yeah. and 70s, those adoptions, secrets and lies, secrets and lies. The whole thing was secrets and lies. Mm. Everybody had to, you know, there were so many lies from both sides, so many secrets from both sides. And then, and I was still doing it as an adult with my own children because I wasn't, couldn't face telling the adoptive parents at that time. I did tell them and I always knew what would happen. And it was the straw that broke the camel's back for them never having anything to do with me again. Um, and I knew that's what would happen. Um, but I, at the time when I first met my birth parents, I was trying to keep both relationships going. I thought it was the right thing to do. I thought, you know, um, I was doing the right thing. But you live and learn. Yeah, but it, no one should ever have to choose, no. to let, let alone the child. And in some ways, that role reversal of you sort of taking over the responsible adult in the, the whole context. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and again, everybody's different. And there are, I've met, I know a lot of people over the years, I've joined many adoption groups. I've got many, many friends who are adoptees or even birth mums and stuff. Um, and some people genuinely adoptive parents genuinely say i'll help you search if you need any help i'll always help you i'll always be there for you um don't keep me in the dark i want to be there for you and i'd love to meet that person that birth mum that birth dad whoever it is one day um you know maybe we can have some kind of relationship and some people do they genuinely do they have yeah. they sit down out of a meal and have all their family members there it's just amazing um so although my birth my uh, finding my birth family and all that side of it was brilliant. You know, it wasn't. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. There's always something, isn't there? Well, I mean, relationships by definition yeah. are, are complicated, even at the best of times. But to, like you said, the, the, to overlay them with secrets and lies, um, just it's a recipe for disaster um, or potentially. Um, so, when, well, how old were you then when you met your your parents? Um, the early thirties, right. early thirties. Yeah. So you've known them for a while now. So does that? Yeah, coming up so next year will be thirty years. Next year we'll be we'll have been um, back together almost as long as we were apart. Wow. Can I yeah. ask him? Um, it's maybe a personal question. Um. So feel free to just say no. Is it often people? I know my children have spoke of it where they, yes, the, 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 the relational stuff is there, 
or the, the biological stuff is there, but the relationship never feels quite, there's always something not quite, it, it doesn't quite, yeah. I'm trying to find the words. Like, yeah. is that still there? Is that, Yeah, it, 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 it is still there, even though I've got the most, I've had a brilliant relationship with them. They were married. So, you know, all the right things. There was no aggro there or anything like that. It's not the same. They didn't bring you up. You haven't got the history. So my two sisters, um, the eldest one, I, I don't have anything to do with her because she couldn't cope with the fact that I'd come into their lives and, in her opinion, taken over as the eldest daughter. So she was the eldest, yeah. she was the princess, and I took her place. Although she knew I existed, they'd always told them I existed. Don't think she ever thought I'd come into their life. And here I come in with children. So I'm an adult with children, so I've given them grandchildren straight away and all that. So really, really put her nose out. So that relationship is non-existent. Um, my second sister, it didn't matter so much to her. She'd already got an older sister. And yeah. we, we've got a lot more in common. You know, there's the genes there in there, isn't there? Her and I are very similar people. We, we've She's got children of her own now. Um, but we've got a big age gap. So there's 16 years between me and the, my youngest sister, which is actually the same exact age gap as me and my mother. So 16 is the thing in our family. Yeah, <laughs> the number that 16. keeps coming back. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that just, I mean, you, you're sort of, you, you, clear that from your point of view this is a good outcome but there's still it seems like there's still things that adopt adoption is still sort of muddied the water even like you say with your younger sister your yeah the, their eldest or not yeah. their eldest middle sister she's become the middle sister against her wishes yeah forever it, it's it's no there's no perfect scenario is there in in adoption no. there isn't but then you were taken from a loving family, probably given to whoever. Some people have wonderful adoptions with parents that worship the ground they walked on and so on. But then so there they felt they couldn't search or find out anymore because they didn't want to hurt those wonderful adoptive parents that brought them up. There's just so many scenarios. Um, you know, there's no such yeah. thing as a perfect adoption. And these days the children are taken away for awful reasons. So they're never going to get over that. So all the different, all the different things. I don't know. It's just a, it's it's just a hard subject to discuss because there's no there's no perfect there's no perfect scenario. Yeah, and um, you mentioned in your book. Um, I don't want to talk about too much about your book because people need to buy it. Clearly, oh, absolutely, um, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So I'll not tell you how it ends. And um, the butler did it. Uh, <laughs> you talk about the movement for an adoption apology. And is yes. that, can you tell me your views and thoughts on that and kind of, you know, if, how yes. much involvement you've So got. recently, I think you would know, and I don't know how many listeners would know, that Nicola Sturgeon apologised yeah. in Scotland um, to those birth, to birth mums, Scottish birth mums, to the terrible things that went on back then. Um, so the movement for adoption and apology is trying to get an apology from our government, i.e. England, um, but it's got supporters in um, Scotland. So we supported Scotland and then Wales as well. And as far as I know, Wales is doing it today at 4.45. That is the word on the street. So, that is um... the word on the street. So when I've uh, finished talking to you, I'll be logging on to the Synod and seeing what's going on. So it might be amazing and Wales may be also apologising and it's 10 years this year since Australia did it mm. since Nicola Gillard um, Julia Gillard stood up and did it and made the world cry um because she was the first as far as I know and it was just the most moving thing ever and it's all we want from our government but they're refusing and saying it's not really there it's not really up to them um but we're not asking for financially, we're not asking for loads yeah. of money or or those those mums who are all getting older, um, because the last ones were in the se were gave birth in the 70s. So all yeah. those mothers are getting older, a lot of them have already died. It's all they want. They want to know that they didn't do anything wrong. 
they didn't do anything wrong. Their babies were taken from them. And they want an apology. Um, a bit of money towards counselling might be nice and a bit more help towards searching, like yeah. the people that haven't managed to search yet need support with that. Um, but nobody's asking for compensation. Nobody's asking for millions and millions. You ruined my life. You took me away. That's not what we wanted. We don't expect the government to do that. That's not what we're asking for. How hard is it to word some nice words and stand up there and apologise for the things that went on? Okay, these people may not have been born then, but that's not what we're saying. We're not asking you to apologise. We're up for what yeah. went on back then. It's not personal culpability. It's it's or it's government culpability. Yeah. No. And it's they've. I know that there's a few occasions where ministers have sort of danced around it. Yes, we've had that. Yes, um, but it does feel like a dance around. And I, do you get any sense of why there's a reticence to do that, or a well, it's a refusal. It's not a reticence at the moment. It's a refusal to do that, isn't it? Well, without sounding just the type of government we've got at the <laughs> moment is all I'll say, shall I? I don't want to get into a political debate. The type of government we've got. You don't at want the to moment. use bad language on the podcast. No, I, no, I better not. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it does feel really like a really odd. I don't think they odd. understand, but they don't seem to want to. So, yes, yeah, yeah. really yeah. intriguing. Yeah. So, can I ask you then? This is probably a, a bit of a an unfair question. But what are your views on adoption now as, you know, as someone whose life has been in, immeasurably impacted by adoption? I still think it's a wonderful institution that's that's actually necessary, but needs a lot of reforms and things tweaking here and there. But there are children out there that should not be with the people that gave birth to them be these days, because those people should not have those children. And when you hear the horrific stories on the news that they took them away and then they gave them back and that baby died at their hands, then you just cry because that's when that baby should have been adopted, loved, taken and loved. And so there are occasions when it's right. It's right. And I totally think, it's right now for totally the opposite reasons back then. Um, but there's a lot of things need changing and yeah. tweaking and looking at to make it better. But it's already a lot better than it was. But it's not perfect by any means. But yes, please keep taking the babies away from the parents that should not do not let them die at those parents' hands. And there are some wonderful people out there that will make amazing parents and do make amazing parents and will love that child no matter what. And they come with issues. As we all know, they do come with issues. But you, if you're the right person for the job, do it. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. And, I mean, there's, we could have an, an awful lot more conversation off off air and um, but what i want to do is really highlight again um your book by gainer cherry ann um, and adopt these journey letters of my life and i'll put the link in the notes so people can chase that. and i really it is actually a really uniquely written way it's it i say this with the utmost respect it's a good toilet book isn't it you can read a read a letter every time you visit and, yeah somebody um, read it on the train like that <laughs> it's perfect it is a really easy book and it's actually quite it it's just a different way of putting it together it's not sort of like a you know, once upon a time story. It's, it's, it's not a novel, no, because I couldn't yeah. even write like that. So I found it so easy to write because I was writing to people in the form of letters, dear whoever, dear birth mum, dear sister, dear so on. And, um, and that's the way it goes through my life and comes out to where I am today. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, I wish you well and um, uh, would love to kind of meet up with you sometime and have a proper natter. Brilliant. Thank you.